Good afternoon, everybody. I think we're gonna go ahead and get started. Thank you so much uh, to everyone for, for joining us. I know many of you um, are still joining us, so feel free. Uh, some of our MBK communities are in a chat room with us, so please feel free to, to introduce yourselves, welcome yourself as, as you come in. Um, my name is Michael Smith. I'm executive director of the My Brothers Keeper Alliance uh, at the Obama Foundation, uh, and I am delighted to welcome you uh, to our My Brothers Keeper Alliance Town Hall series. Uh, which will today be focused on mental health and wellness and what the American Psychological Association has dubbed as a racism pandemic. Um, before we go any further, it is important to acknowledge that today would have been Breonna Taylor's 27th birthday. Uh, she should be here celebrating with us. Today, across our channels, we are saying her name and we are honoring the work towards justice for Breonna Taylor. Her friends and her family members said Breonna was a caring person who loved her job as an EMT and a healthcare worker and enjoyed playing cards with her aunts. She is our sister, she is our daughter, she is our niece, and we remember her and we cherish her memory. And we cherish the way too many women of color whose names are not spoken, who gone unnoticed and unheard. And right now, before we go any further, I not only want to encourage you to go to obama.org to find out how you can donate to the Breonna Taylor Memorial Fund and other actions that you can take, but I want to take a brief moment of silence in which all of you that have access to our chat window, I encourage you to write the names of the young women who have been taken from us, who have been killed, who have been forgotten, uh, that we should remember. Uh, for those of you who can't speak Brianna's name, speak those names uh, where you stand. So please join me in a moment to remember Brianna. Thank you, MBK family. And I think we all know that the MBK family is not just about words, but we're about action. So do uh, please go to Obama.org, not only speak her name, but take actions to make sure um, we remember her, that we take care of her family and that we seek justice um, for her life. Today's space and today's town hall will allow us to reflect on the emotional and mental toll racism and police violence has on men of color and our families and the steps that we need to take to stay well, whole and healthy while we work to create a better world. You know, My Brother's Keeper firmly believes in our responsibility to be intersectional in everything that we do, knowing deeply that our hopes, our fears, our dreams, and our triumphs are inextric inextricably linked uh, to our sisters and our family members across gender and race. We believe that in word and deed, and as we lift up leadership and voice of sisters and allies and advance programs and policies that advance the life and liberty of all members of our communities, in today's town hall, we decided to intentionally create a space, uh, a unique space where men of color and boys of color could talk about the challenges and opportunity that they face in an America uh, to center their voices um, and really think about the toxic masculinity that often makes it hard uh, to talk about these issues uh, in a world that tells them that they aren't supposed to hurt. So I'm gonna go ahead and start off these conversations with legends and heroes. Uh, who have been at the front lines of social justice, working through way too much pain for way too long, and also with some of our young leaders that are just getting started in this work today. Uh, and to start off this conversation, we have an incredible moderator, Darnell Elmore. And if you look closely enough, you can see Darnell's uh, book, No Ashes in the Fire, Coming of Age, Black and Free in America, on my bookshelf, uh, which was listed as a 2018 New York Times notable book and a Barnes and Noble Discover Great New Writers pick. Uh, Darnell is also a writer in residence at the Center on African American Religion, Sexual Politics and Social Justice at Columbia University, and a 2019 senior fellow at the Annenberg Innovation Lab at the University of South Carolina. He has too many accolades and writings and awards in order to go through all of them, um, but we're thrilled uh, to anchor this conversation today as a powerful young man of color himself. Uh, please join me in welcoming Darnell Moore. Thank you so much, Michael, and thank you to um, the Obama Foundation, NBK, for having this conversation in this moment. Um, I'm really glad to be part of it and really, really excited to introduce someone who really needs no introduction at all. Um, that is President Obama. 
and the intergenerational panelists who will be joining President Obama in conversation, including Congressman John Lewis, Brian Stevenson, Leon Ford, and Laquan McDonald. One of the things I think we should say before we get started is that this conversation is meant to be intimate, um, communal, and also a space for, for Black men, for men of color, um, to experience and model vulnerability. So in that regard, I want to open by marking the time that we're in. This conversation is happening during an unprecedented time. We are gathered during a pandemic and within a period where we have witnessed racial violence. Between COVID-19 and the killings of Ahmaud Aubrey, Breonna Taylor, who Michael alluded to, whose birthday is today, and George Floyd, we are in what we might be best described as a storm within a storm. So many of us are not okay. So before we get into really deep conversation, I'd love to start by having us ground ourselves and check in. So I'm going to ask that the conversation partners use one word to describe how you're feeling right now. And President Obama, I'd love to start with you. Motivated. Faith. Congress, thank you. Leon. What about Brian? Honorable. Mm. Uh, determined. And Laquan. Propitious. Oh, that's a big word. <laughs> Laquan's coming with the big words already from the start. Um, this is an intergenerational conversation, and it's an opportunity for us to listen and learn and share across generations. And there's much that we can learn from the younger generation. So I want to start with you, Leon. I want, your, want you to talk a little bit about your story. It's one of pain and healing. In 2012, you were shot and paralyzed by police during a routine traffic stop. And you've since shared your story widely, and you've taken action by doing things like organizing healing circles. So I want you to talk about what it takes for any of us, for you, to have moved from pain um, that is a consequence of racism and racial violence to the activism, to using your activism and that pain as a tool for healing and transformation. Thank you. Um, it takes belief. I, I had to believe that the world wasn't as bad as my experience. And even though my experience was painful, um, it was an opportunity for me to uh, step up and use my voice as a way to heal the world. And so, um, although I was impacted in a, in a very negative way and my life was forever changed, I saw a golden opportunity for me to help others. Thanks so much. President Obama, I want to turn to you. Um, you've heard from Leon and his testimony of pain and healing. And I'm reminded of your own story of pain and the context is different but you've written and talked about the pain you, that gripped you after losing your dad, after losing your grandfather and mom, and losing your grandma the day before the election. Through loss, you had to lead a nation through recession. How'd you make it through? What gave you the strength to show up, not just for yourself, but for the nation, even though you were moving through the pain of loss? Well, first of all, uh, I, I, I wanna be clear that when I hear some Buddy like Leon speak, uh, and what he has gone through and then been able, like a phoenix, to rise out of those ashes. Uh, when I think about my dear friend and uh, the inspiration uh, for so much of what I did, John Lewis, and what he faced, uh, I think it's important for us to recognize that um, you know, the things I went through pale in comparison to the challenges that Leon's gone through or that John's gone through and that some of the other people on this panel have gone through. And the reason I, I bring that up now is because what I have found throughout my life is that my strength comes from connecting my story to other people's stories. So that if I am having a tough time, then I'm thinking back, well, if John Lewis wasn't scared, or if he overcame his fear, then what right do
do I have to be scared or intimidated? And if somebody like Leon can come out of a horrible experience and somehow deal with his bitterness, then how do I uh, indulge in my bitterness? And I think that, you know, maybe the best example I'll use just because it's recent and I think everybody is familiar with it is uh, after the Charleston shootings. And I've, I've, I've talked a little bit about this, but, um, you know, that, that was coming towards the end of my presidency. And I had already gone through so many mass shootings and watched Congress unwilling to move in any kind of way to curb gun violence in this country. And there is almost a ritualistic quality that had taken place where everybody says, oh, the families are in our thoughts and prayers. And you know, there's a gesture towards this should never happen, but then nobody ever does anything. And then when Charleston happened, there's the convergence of a mass shooting and the, the racial hatred that was at the root of it coming at the same time. And there was a part of me that told my staff, I, I, I remember saying this, look, I, I, wanna, I wanna go to the funeral and I wanna hug the families. I don't think I wanna talk. I, I, I just, I don't know what else to say. I feel as if I have run out of words because I've been doing this too much and it doesn't seem to have any impact on me. And, and I don't want to perpetrate this notion that somehow this is normal. Um, of course, the families then said, no, we'd like you to at least say something. And so now I'm trying to figure out what to say. And I, I remember um, puzzling over it. Uh, and then some of you may recall, the family said, we, we forgive this misguided, hateful young man, because that is our faith. Because there's been a Bible study in which uh, this terrible deed had taken place. And I remember thinking about the, the concept of grace and, and seeing what that those families were displaying in their tragedy. Uh, and that's when I came up with and, and wrote very quickly uh, the speech that I delivered in which I ended up singing. I say that because it was their strength, not my strength, that I was relying on. Right? It, it was their, their grace that then bathed me in grace. It was the traditions of the church and the memories of, and, and, and overcoming that fortified me and is what I tried to transmit in my remarks. So I, I guess maybe just to summarize, uh, for all of us, uh, usually when I'm overwhelmed, discouraged, angry, depressed, what has lifted me up is when I don't feel alone and I can connect what is going on with me to what is going on with us. And I think that, uh, you know, it, it, is a, uh, it is a profound thing when you are able to, to, to recognize that um, whatever's happening to you, whatever you're going through, uh, it's not just about you. And it, you're not the only one going through it. And that usually ends up being um, a source of, 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 of power. And, 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 uh, uh, and then sometimes you can turn pain into joy as a consequence.
Thank you. I want to ask you, Congr Congressman Lewis, um, you too have a story of pain and resilience. You were present and marching in Selma, um, 1965, before and after that. You were beaten while peacefully protesting on what is now known as Bloody Sunday. But that didn't deter you from your continued fight for freedom. And like Leon, like so many others, you faced overwhelming pain as a result of racism or violence, but you continue to show up for community, you continue to show up for the fight anyhow. What was, what was and what has been the source of your strength? What keeps you going and what keeps you fighting? More than anything, my faith kept me, held me together. And I couldn't give up, could not give in. I thought when I was being beaten on the bridge, I thought I saw death. I thought I was going to die. And I said a little prayer. Say, Lord, let me live. I want to stay here. I want to be around. And I believe it was the grace of God and praying witnesses that helped save me. And so today I feel more lucky, more than lucky, more than blessed, but to be here, to see the changes that have occurred, to live to see a young man, a young friend, like President Barack Obama, become president of the United States of America. It was worth the pain. And that's why I believe that we cannot give up, we cannot give in, become bitter or hostile. And to see all of the young people, all of the young men, not just men of color, but black, white, Latino, Asian American, Native American, all of the young women standing up, speaking up, being prepared to march. They're going to help redeem the soul of America and save our country and maybe help save the planet. Congressman Lewis, thank you so much. Um, Brian, your story is one that has captured the attention of so many people, and rightly so. You went from being a young lawyer in Alabama who faced many slam doors. Your first client was executed, but you would end up building one of the most impactful and life-saving human rights organizations in the US and arguably around the world. Through your journey, um, and those are the people whom you fought on behalf of, what have you learned about trauma? and healing and wholeness that you think can be shared across generations. Well, well, thank you. And it's such an honor to be a part of this incredible uh, panel. I think one of the things I've learned is that you have to be truthful. You have to be honest about articulating the reality in which you exist, that you can't hide from it. You can't distract yourself from understanding the nature of the problem. When I think about the experience of black people in this country, we all have stories, but when I think about the experience of black people in this country, it's a hard thing to face sometimes uh, that our four parents were kidnapped and trafficked uh, to this country and then enslaved and chained and beaten and brutalized. And after the Civil War, they were promised freedom, but they didn't get freedom. They got terror and violence. They weren't allowed to vote. They were denied those rights that the Constitution gave them. And then they were pulled out of their homes for nearly a century and, and lynched and hanged and burned and menaced. And then they had to live in places where the law humiliated them through Jim Crow and segregation. And they were denied opportunities. Uh, and they were told that they're not as valuable, they're less deserving, less worthy. And then we moved into this era when so many of us had so much hope. And here we still find ourselves over-policed and over-prosecuted and over-convicted and over-sentenced and marginalized and frequently denied opportunities. And I think we have to have the courage 
to understand the moment that we are in, but then we have to have uh, the ability to look back and understand our capacity. And that's the thing that amazes me. I, you know, I was a product of Brown versus Board of Education. I thought that uh, if I did the things they told me to do, I started in a colored school, the lawyers came in and opened up the public schools. I thought if I did all the hard work, that everything was gonna be great, there'd be equality. And I did my part, I think, I studied, I went to high school, I went to college, I got admitted to Harvard Law School. I graduated from Harvard Law School. I started practicing law and I was on the street in Atlanta, Georgia, a few years after graduating, uh, preparing for a case when police officers uh, stopped me. Uh, I got out of the car and the police officers pulled their gun, they pointed it at my head and they said, move and I'll blow your brains out. And I had to calm those officers down and I was humiliated by people in the community. And it was painful to me to reckon with this fact that all of that hard work and education didn't shield me from that threat and violence. And I have argued cases at the Supreme Court and I still go into courtrooms where judges who don't know me will tell me to leave the courtroom and wait until my lawyer gets here. And the reality of that has to be articulated and expressed. Black people in this country are presumed dangerous and guilty and we have to manage and navigate these presumptions and I think it's important to admit to the burden of that. And I will tell you, I've gotten, I've gotten old enough now that I, I, when you have to keep navigating these things, you get tired and I'm exhausted of living in a world where we have to navigate all of these challenges. But the other thing that I know is that when I look back, I have something that is really powerful. And what I have is this ability to say, despite all of those things, despite the slavery and the lynching and the segregation and the humiliation and the mass incarceration and the police violence, I am here. And I'm here lifted up by all of these people who did all of these things. I'm the great grandson of people who were enslaved in Virginia. My great grandfather, slaved in Caroline County, Virginia, learned to read while enslaved because he had this belief that one day he would be free. And he invested in his mind, even though it was dangerous. And when emancipation came, my grandmother told me all of the enslaved people, formerly enslaved people would come to their home and she would sit next to him and every night he would read the newspaper. And she loved the power that that created. And she said, I wanna to learn to read too. And even though there weren't schools, she became a good reader. And she gave that gift to my mother, her youngest of 10 children. And her, my mother gave that to me. We were poor, but my mom actually went into debt to buy the World Book Encyclopedia because she had this hope that if we feed our mind, we can overcome. And that's the thing I wanna say is that you have to take care of your mind. You have to be aware. You have to understand the world around you. But they didn't stop with that. The other thing they did was they said, you have to protect your heart. You know, despite enslavement, people found ways to love one another enough to create another generation. My grandparents were terrorized and fled the American South to the North as exiles and refugees from that violence. And yet they loved one enough to create a generation uh, that might have hope. My parents were humiliated by Jim Crow laws. Those signs that said white and colored, they weren't directions, they were assaults, they created injuries. And yet in the midst of it, they loved one another to, to create another generation. And they gave that love to me. And that's why I think to endure all these hard times you have to have a knowing mind, a curious mind, an informed mind, but you also have to have a full heart, a heart that appreciates the love that brought you here. And when the ideas in your mind are fueled by the convictions in your heart, you become part of this journey that endures. I live in Montgomery, Alabama. I can't help but think about that generation, Congressman Lewis's generation that had so much less than we have. I'm standing on the shoulders of people who did so much more with so much less and they would go to places and protest in their Sunday best and they'd be on their knees praying when they were battered and bloodied and beaten. And then they would stand up and say, we shall overcome. That's the mind and the heart connecting in something that is impossible to defeat. And black people in this country are undefeated in our resolve that we will be free, that we will demand justice, that we will get there. That's the thing that sustains me. So I think you have to look back, be willing to confront the truth of what you're seeing and then make your mind full and make your heart full and let those two, uh, two powerful parts of you uh, lead you forward. Thank you, Brian. I'm over here in the amen corner. <laughs> About to run around my living room like I'm in a church house. Um, Laquan, I want to turn to you, Laquan Muhammad. Um, as we listen to these stories shared by the other panelists, I'm thinking about the ways that injustice and deep pain and inequity and personal loss and triumph 
can be the forces that move many people towards the fight for justice, equity, and freedom. Your father's incarceration, like that of my own father, um, has been at the heart of your work as a citizen journalist who helped to pass California Proposition 47, which allows for the downgrading of violent, nonviolent felonies to misdemeanors. That resulted in your dad being released. You literally became the tool for your dad's freedom. I want you to talk a bit about your journey and the lessons learned on that journey um, that many of us can grab hold of right now. Well, I'd like to also say uh, thank you for the opportunity. I appreciate talking to you all. And uh, yes, uh, but yeah, well, my journey started like early, like uh, about like high school, my beginning years, ninth and 10th. Uh, just messing up, uh, you know, not being the best I could be, getting in trouble, you know, various forms of trouble, law and school, different things like that. Um, and just understanding that I wanted to be better, but just didn't know how. And so it eventually uh, chronicalized into uh, me and these dudes in the classroom. Um, it was called the Social Justice Learning Institute, Black Male Youth Academy. And so uh, just in there, just... Um, trying to understand my traumas uh, and just kind of like address my, the different oppressions that I'm going through, different things like that. And then like putting that all together and understanding the different disparities that I'm seeing every day in my community and how can I address that and how can I be, become more so a part of the solution and not the problem. And so um, it just led me into more work. It, it led me deeper into social justice uh, we started like uh, working on like youth participatory action research. And so we would just go and survey and do different things, you know, just to kind of like build ideas and stuff like that. And so I just started to kind of like feel it more in myself. Like I, I'm changing things. I'm starting to be different in myself. I'm starting to even understand that, you know, the ways I can help my community better and stuff like that. And so um, I finally got um, introduced to Prop 47. We went to uh, a meeting, right? Like kind of like by my school and they introduced it to me then. And uh, I had to do the research on how I could help me out and how I could help my family out. And I seen that it could help my father out because he yeah, had went to jail uh, for drug charges. And so all putting this together, it's kind of like lighting this fire in me. Like I gotta, you know, if I don't jump on it now, I feel like the opportunity will pass me. And so like I immediately, you know, just, everything I had in myself and, and you know, gave it to uh, Prop 47. And so uh, along with also the Obama Foundation, so it helped me bring my, bring my father home, so that as well. But just all, all, all of it was like understanding like the role of, you know, the father and the father not being there and how it's so detrimental for, you know, not just young men of color, but just, just men just children in general, just, you know, not having that discipline or not having that aspect of a father figure to, you know, lean back on or someone to look forward to or look up to, you know, to have that, you know, that, that kind of like guidance and kind of like always was something that I've always questioned. And so I helped it move me at the end and, and kind of like bring me closer to uh, me and my father and stuff like that. Thank you so much. Um, I have a question that, uh, I want us to ponder. Um, and I'm, I'm interested, Leon and Laquan, in your thoughts and also open to hearing from um, the others, but community healing requires community. Community means all of us, right? And it seems that one of the lessons that we are learning from the generation, this present generation, is the reality that our idea of community has to be so wide, so expansive. Um, folk are seeing Breonna Taylor's name alongside of George Floyd's. Um, they are proclaiming that all Black Lives Matter, whether those Black folks show up as straight or LGBT. With that in mind, what does a caring and healed community of the future look like? What do we need to build that vision out? I want to ask Le Leon for you to, to respond to that, and then I'm going to turn to you, Laquan, and then open it up to some others if you want to. Thank you. Um... There's an African proverb that reads, when there is no enemy within, the enemy outside cannot hurt me. And so from my perspective, in order to build a strong community, we need to build strong individuals, right? We need to weed out those, uh, the enemies within our minds and in our hearts, right? Uh, that's why I focus on mental health and I go to therapy, which helps me to be a stronger pillar and a stronger man for my son, right? And a, 
um, and a, a respectful son to my parents. Uh, it also helps me to be more intention, in, intentional and, and healthy as I make my community stronger. And as I help to make my community stronger, I help to make my city stronger. And as I help to make my city stronger, we help to make you know, my state, Pennsylvania, stronger, which if everyone focused on that, we can make the, the country stronger. Uh, and every country becomes stronger, then the world becomes stronger. Uh, we need you know, more open communication. Uh, we need to be more uh, mindful and thoughtful of you know, everyone's lived experience uh, because we're all carrying uh, trauma. And so I, I like to lead from a place of love, uh, a place of compassion and a place of understanding. Uh, and that's what you, really what I had to use uh, with my work with uh, police officers, right? Uh, I was full of so much hatred um, and, and I had to you know, tackle that hatred within myself. Um, and, and so I, it was hard for me to start with love working with police officers, so I had to start with understanding. And so I took courses and I learned about the history of policing in this country, which helped me understand, you know, how they were trained, um, the policies and procedures, um, which then I became more compassionate because I learned about some of the things that they are faced with every day. Um, and I'm still working on the love part, honestly. Um, but it, it's a it's a process that I that I think uh, is is possible. Thank you. I don't know, Laquan, if you want to add words. Oh man, uh, you just kind of like to piggy off piggyback off what my brother uh, Leon said. Uh, yeah, it, it is about like kind of like building yourself first, because you know you don't want to go be having a, a a backpack full of traumatic experiences and trying to you know go and help other people and you haven't even addressed the situations in yourself. So yeah, my brother is exactly right. I also think like uh, just a lot of intergenerational trauma that comes with the families that we have to address and also recognize that it's mo most times it's not even the problems that we have on ourselves. It's a lot of the problems that's being passed down throughout the families, it's different things like that. So just addressing that and just always like looking to love one another and, uh, and recognizing that everybody is a, uh, flawed everybody has something wrong with them or something that will be that will be problematic for them in the future and uh whether they recognize that or not just understanding that that is something that we all have as humans and as long as we work in f working on it together uh I, I think we'll always be able to uh, be able to move forward and progress i mean a lot of people are a lot of things are happening in people's lives but uh most of the times they happen just in different aspects so thank you um, I want to pull from the wisdom of, of our other folk, um, President Obama and Congressman Lewis and Brian Stevenson. What do we need to, what does the future uh, looks like for a, a community where all of us are cared for and healed, where we're thinking about difference and how to celebrate difference and bring that difference into our healing processes? Well, th th there are a couple of things that, uh, we have to start with uh, our, our individual health depends on our societal health and you know the legacy of slavery jim crow the experience that brian describes in his family uh, you know part of having knowledge of that is recognizing that uh, we inherited extraordinary strengths, but we also inherited trauma. Uh, you know, violence passes itself down through generations like DNA. Uh, institutions start, uh, you know, they're founded not just on bricks and mortar, but they're also founded on injustice often and, and slaughter. And so if you don't know that, past, then you will oftentimes internalize what you're seeing around you. And, and so I, I do think that why I'm motivated, and I mentioned the other day, inspired by so much of what I've been seeing, despite the root tragedy of it, is that there has been as much honest conversation about 
the topic of race in this country in the last week, as has taken place in my living memory. Uh, and it is a conversation that is not exclusive to one community, but the whole country, at least a sizable portion of the country is wanting to have that conversation. So, so th that's point number one, I guess I, I would start with. Um, point number two is that uh, there is an objective reality that makes us less healthy, right? Uh, you know, I, I, I can lecture folks about uh, eating right and staying in shape, but if you are living in a community that is polluted and you don't have access to health care and you don't have a place where you can buy, you know, fresh groceries unless you take a bus and travel to another neighborhood, um, then it's hard, it's a lot harder. And I think in the same way that that's true for our physical well-being, uh, the, 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 the psychological well-being that so many individuals go through, the stresses, the strains, the tensions, um, those external realities have to be addressed. And, and part of our knowledge is recognizing, no, those are real and it's gonna impact us. Uh, and, and so let's not pretend like we're not putting up with a lot of stuff like that. Because otherwise we start thinking, well, what's entirely wrong with us? Now, the, the, the final point though is, is I think that, you know, uh, ultimately we have to, um, having looked reality square in the face, having begun a broad conversation, um, we then have to take responsibility for doing something about it. And I, I think that's always the, 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 the fork in the road, right? If, if you're dealing with a tough reality, in this case, the reality of racism in, in our society and that long legacy, then uh, our capacity to take action despite that reality or because of that reality to try to change it, um, to, to me is part of health because, because you're saying to yourself, no, I have agency. I can make a difference. I can have an impact. I might not be able to change all of it, but I can change this corner of it. Uh, you know, I, I, I might not be Brian Stevenson and I've got a whole organization, but I'm a young lawyer. I can take one case and serve justice in then this one case. I, I might be, you know, I might not have a, a column in the New York Times, but in my local community paper, I can write about this thing that's happened and maybe spread some information and knowledge, right? So, so uh, ultimately, I think community gets built when each of us has knowledge about the reality that's going on. We've had a conversation about it. And then each of us feels as if we have agency and responsibility for making it better. Um, because the, the alternative, and I think this is always the, the challenge that we have, one alternative is to ignore the reality or paper it over. And I think historically that has been the tendency certainly among uh, those who are more privileged in our society. And the white community oftentimes just doesn't want to hear it. Um, or says you're playing the race card or you're exaggerating and, and part of what's happened with videos is suddenly it turns out, well, at a certain point, now you can't ignore it because you're seeing it. But, but that's a natural human reaction. Uncomfortable realities, let's put it outside of ourselves. But another re reaction is, is to say, yeah, that's the reality and I am helpless to change it. And, and that becomes as debilitating. Uh, and and de dis destructive to, to the soul if, if you feel as if I have no power. And, and, and the thing I always, you know, the, the, the thing I've always told my daughters, the thing I used to say to folks when I was community organizing, everybody's got some power. 
And we give away so much of our power on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, we sell ourselves short so often. Uh, you know, it, 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 I love John Lewis. I love that man. He, he ha has as big of a, a heart and a soul as, as anybody I know. But let's face it, when he started marching, he was, he was younger than Laquan, or about his age. Didn't nobody know his name. He didn't have a title. He, he didn't have a, a, a big philanthropy backing him. He, you know, he, he wasn't, a, he, he wasn't a Sugar Ray Robinson. He wasn't an athlete that was famous. So how does this kid, and, and you know, those of you who meet John, John's tough, but he's a little, he's kind of a little dude. You would not know that that young man could awaken a nation. And, 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 and that's an example of the power that we each have. Uh, and, and that's why when I see these young people out here right now, uh, I am, I am inspired because really what's going on is suddenly they're saying, A, we, we don't accept the status quo, we're angered, shocked, et cetera, but B, we know we've got some power. And they, and, and, and they haven't necessarily figured out every, in every instance how to uh, exercise that, uh, you know, seamlessly and perfectly, that, that's always an evolution, right? We, it, it always takes time to start figuring out how do you use it uh, strategically and tactically, but they're, they're starting to figure out that, that they have power. And, and in that sense, I actually think that um, uh, they will feel better over the long term, even if there's some discomfort and confusion in the short term. Thanks for that. We all got power. We all got power. I have a, a final question for the group and um, and a question since this is a, a conversation, an intergener intergenerational conversation, what it is it that we need from each other? And if you were to turn to the folk that you're in conversation with on this panel, what would you need from the other person? So I'm going to ask for you, President Obama, um, to start, what do you need from each other? Uh, listen, everybody in this panel is doing such great work, has done great work. Um, you know, the main thing I need everybody to do is just keep on doing what you're doing and, and not lose faith and not lose hope and, and not be discouraged. Um, I know that this was billed as an intergenerational panel, so let me pick up just on that theme very briefly to say two things. Um, I do think that young people can learn from old heads like me, but even, and, and you know, <laughs> Brian used to be a young man, but he's actually right behind me now. Um, so I'm not sure he qualifies anymore. Um, uh, John's always been young at heart, but, but I, I, I do think that young people can learn from the older generation. Um, yes, strategy, tactics, we've made mistakes. So no point in remake, make your own mistakes. Don't make the mistakes we made. We, we can tell you where we screwed up uh, or we, uh, uh, you know, missed an opportunity or what have you. Uh, but I think the most important thing that, that older, an older generation can provide is, is perspective. Uh, the, and perspective is useful in the set, and, I, and I'll give a very specific example. I, I said this two days ago on our other town hall. When I said I was feeling optimistic because I do not believe that what we're seeing now is actually equivalent to what was happening in, in 1968. Now, we don't yet know how this is going to play out. And it can take some bad turns, and Lord knows there are some bad forces out there uh, who, who are, are looking not at this as a moment of opportunity, but as a moment of fear and, and resistance and backlash. But 
um, I, I have the perspective as someone older to be able to say that if you had told me that you would see marches not just in LA or Atlanta or New York, but you're seeing them in you know, small towns in Oregon and Utah. And, and on behalf of racial justice, and that you would see uh, former presidents and CEOs and uh, you know, part of the power structure even say the words systemic racism and suggest that that's unacceptable. That's not a panacea. That's no guarantee of success, but it is a marker of all the work that people like a Brian or a John have done, or the inspiration that young people like Laquan and Leon, the impact you've had on the larger society in a way that is different than it was 50 years ago. It doesn't guarantee success. And Lord knows this is a society that has a way of, when there's a crisis, putting, you know, uh, putting on a front like it's going to do something and then not doing it. But those people out on the streets, that, that is a, that's a sea change. And, and so a younger generation can hear from an old person and say, oh, you should be inspired. Because this is a mark of how things can move if you keep it up. The flip side is older folks, I think, can learn from young people in patience. Right? I, you know, the, the, the great thing about, uh, you know, when I think about Malia and Sasha and their friends, you know, they believe what they, that, that they believe what they were taught in school. They didn't think that ideas like equality were empty words. And so when they see a society violate those tenets, they're shocked and angry and they, they're, no, 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 we got to change this now. Whereas I think what happens as you get older is there, you start getting cynical and you start saying, you know what, this is how it always is. And so the, the value of having different generations working together around this is, is that uh, the generation that's been there can say, you know, I, I know a little bit about this territory, uh, but the younger folks, they can say, yeah, but, but we're not stopping here. We got, we got more, to, more road to trap. Uh, and, and so let's get, up, let's, let's get up from this place. It might be better than that place, but it's not good enough for us. We, we got more marching, more, more, more walking to do. And, uh, and, and that, I think, is what I've been, uh, been feeling so good about. Uh, despite uh, the sadness and anger that, that I've been seeing. Thank you, President Obama. I want to go to you, Congressman Lewis. Um, what do we need from each other? We need to tell people, tell each other to be hopeful, to be optimistic, and to never, ever give up or to get down. I tell you, the past few days have been so inspiring to me to see so many young people, so many children, the diversity, they give me great hope. And we're going to get there. It's all going to work out. But we must help it work out. So we must continue to be bold, brave, courageous, push and pull to re-redeem the soul of America and move closer to a community at peace with itself. But no one, but no one will be left out or left behind because of race, or color, or nationality. We have to lay down the burden of hate.
Thank you so much, Congress, Congressman Lewis. And we're almost out of time. So I'm gonna turn to Brian and Leon and Laquan um, and just mindful of time. I wanna ask you two, uh, what do you need from each other uh, before we close out? Well, Let's go with you, Brian. Okay, sure. Yeah, I, I just, I, I need for us, I hope we will all recognize that there is something better waiting for us. Uh, there is something that feels more like freedom than any of us have experienced. There's something that feels more like equality, that feels more like justice than what we've experienced. You know, I talk a lot about our past, our history, and sometimes when people hear me talking about slavery and lynching and segregation, they think I want to punish America for what's happened in the past. I have no interest in punishment. My interest is actually liberation. I just believe there is something better waiting for us. And if we're willing to tell the truth, I think what follows truth telling is the opportunity for redemption. My faith uh, tradition is you come in and if you're willing to confess and repent, there's something that is redeeming and restoring and uplifting. And that's what I think we just have to willing, we have to believe. If you believe things, even if you haven't seen them, you'll achieve things that haven't been achieved before. I had to believe I could be a lawyer, even though I'd never met a lawyer until I got to Harvard Law School. I had to believe I could create an organization that could help people get off death row. And I think that's what we need. And, and, and the other part of it is that we do need to recognize uh, the power that President Obama was talking about. We have an incredible opportunity in this moment to do things that have never been done before. And because of the work of people like John Lewis, this is the time to stand. You know, Dr. King talked about seeing the promised land. Many of us are closer uh, than anybody's ever been before. But the closer you get to something valued and protected and precious, the more obstacles emerge. And so we have to be willing to recognize that being able to see it is not the same thing as getting there. And that's why I think this belief that we can't accept um, a little bit of justice, a little bit of freedom, a little bit of equality. We have to have real freedom, real equality, real justice. That has to continue to sustain how we treat one another. And I feel that way when I listen to Leon and Laquan I'm so proud of you all for lifting up your true stories, uh, presenting who you are, and then taking what you've done and who you are and doing the things you've done. That's what gives me hope. And I want you to keep inspiring people like me by being reformers in the criminal justice space and doing the hard work you're doing. That's what will sustain and energize me uh, for the rest of my days. Thank you, Leon. I believe we need honesty, uh, transparency, uh, vulnerability, and brotherhood. Um, and if I can just, you know, uh, leave you all with this, if you can internalize these words, um, we must give up to go up. We must give up to grow up. We must give up on the way up and give up even more to stay up. I cannot teach what I do not know. I cannot lead where I will not go. I am because we are. We are because I am. I am my brother's keeper. I am my sister's keeper. I am destined for greatness because I attract what I am. And I thank you all um, for this opportunity. Leon, thank you. Laquan? It is kind of hard coming through after that, man. That was good right there, bro. That was nice. But uh, uh, basically, uh, what I'd like to just leave people with is uh, uh, just more accountability is what I would ask for. Just, you know, if there's any way I could help you all in your, you all's movement, I understand that, you know, time, uh, geographical locations and different things might play a part. But if there's any way I can help, I, I'd love to be a part of that. You know what I'm saying? Uh, uh, also, just uh, any way I could just reach out um, and just put my best foot forward in any way. And also, like, I just wanted to uh, – finish off from what you said earlier about being alone. Uh, most times um, when we stand on alone, we think like, oh, you know, we, we hear by ourselves and different things like that, or, or people don't like us, you know, because uh, our views are different things like that. But um, I was talking to one of my uh, uncles the other day, and he was just telling me like, um, most people don't understand their their spot or their role in the in the revolution or in the movement yet. And so when you get up, and you, you know, you, 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 you are that eyeball or you, you make that first gesture into creating something different. You may spark something in them that they might not have even known was there. So that's just what I'd like to leave with. Thank you so much, Mr. President. I think this brings us to a close, unless you have final thoughts. You know what, I think uh, 
Leon and, and Laquan, uh, they, they just modeled what I'm talking about when I, when I say that uh, this younger generation, it's coming. It's inspired. Uh, our job is to support you guys, uh, to, to hear you, to listen to you, to, to let you know you matter. Uh, and, you know, we were talking earlier about mental health. One thing I, I maybe forgot to mention, uh, because I've been thinking about this a lot. Um, you know, when, when I am not acting my best towards other people, it's usually because I've got some insecurity. Uh, it, because I have something inside me that I don't feel good about, right? And so I project that out onto other people. Um, you know, a, a lot of what we see with respect to racism uh, is somebody who doesn't feel good about themselves wanting to lift themselves above somebody else. That, you know, that the whole basis of the racial hierarchy is status. It's power, it's resources, but it's also psychologically, well, at least I'm not that person below me. Um, the same is true oftentimes with sexism or people who don't, or are, are afraid of gay people. Uh, you know, and part of, I guess, what I want to just uh, lift up is the, the, what Leon said and Laquan referred to, uh, when, when you're able to go ahead and acknowledge, yeah, I'm, I'm scared, I'm hurt, I, I get depressed, et cetera, because I know we were going to be focusing on mental health, um, that, that strengthens you. And, and then you're, you've got a stable base from which to meet the world and, uh, and, and tackle whatever anybody throws at you because you know yourself and you know what you've been through and you know what you've had to overcome. Um, you know, sometimes I feel as if those who are in power don't know themselves at all and, and, and so much of what they do. Right? When you saw the police officer put his knee on George Floyd's neck, if you're not in yourself frightened and needing to do that because there's something missing in you, strong, strong folks don't do that, right? There are other people in power who sometimes are lashing out or putting other people down. It's because they're, they've got something in them they've got to work through. And, and, and so I, I just want to say, every time I hear people like Raquan and Leon talk, uh, it tells me they're on the right track because they're not just thinking about what's outside, but they're also thinking about um, getting in tune with, with uh, who they are and what they've gone through. And, and, and I think that that's going to be an important part of this process. And that's political too. They, you know, the, 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 this isn't just about policy and budget. Sometimes it's about just, just knowing your strength um, and facing your fears. And, and you guys are doing that. So I'm very proud of you. Keep it up. And, and Darnell, thanks for being such a great host. No, thank you, um, President Obama. Uh, thank you for your words. Um, before we let everybody go, the panel portion of this will end, but the conversation will continue. Um, but before we continue, let's if you join us virtually in, in, in silent applause or virtual applause um, to President Obama for in instigating this conversation, giving us the space and the panelists, um, the well-respected, admirable Congressman Lewis, Brian Stevenson, also Leon and Laquan, thank you all for modeling vulnerability um, and for leaning in. Um, we're going to continue the conversation. We invite the panelists to step away, to breathe a bit, um, and we're going to move into the next um, portion of this conversation. Appreciate you guys. God bless. So I want to introduce Dr. Evans, um, author C. Evans, who is going to be joining us, who is the president and CEO of the American Psychological Association who recently um, did some work talking, around, talking about this notion of a racism pandemic. Um, so let's welcome Dr. Evans. Um, Dr. Evans, you here? 
I am here. Thank you so much for inviting me to be here. This is a great, um, this is a great gathering. Awesome. So I have a few questions for you. Um, the American Psychological Association released a statement on what you all have named a racism pandemic. So first, what's a racism pandemic and what is the impact of compounding pandemics? You know, on the one hand, we have uh, a sustained form of racial violence. And on the other hand, we have coronavirus, which has disproportionately impacted black and brown people. What are three things black and brown people can do? Um, I'm, com I'm giving you some questions all in one because I know we have limited time. So I want you to talk about race as a pandemic, the sort of compounding nature, right? of these pandemics and three things that folk can do to support their emotional and mental health during this period of time. Okay, well, thank you. There, there is a lot in there. So the reason that we use the, the racism pandemic as a frame is because there are a lot of parallels between the way a viral pandemic operates and the way racism operates. Uh, a pandemic, uh, a racism, uh, a, a pandemic is widespread. Um, it uh, is affecting uh, many people. Uh, it is uh, harmful. It is affecting a lot of uh, a lot of aspects of our lives. And if we're not careful, it will make us sick and it will even kill us. And I think that there are a lot of parallels between the way a virus works and the way racism works. And just like with a virus, you have to have protective, personal protective equipment, PPE. We've heard a lot of talk about that. You know, every day people of color are putting on protective personal equipment. And they do that by uh, the, their coping strategies. They do that by um, the way they have to manage and move, navigate and, and maneuver in life. Um, every day, you know, when I go to my office uh, here in Washington, uh, I walk by brothers who are homeless, who are living on the streets. Uh, and that, that affects me. That, impacts on me. Uh, and I have to compartmentalize because when I go into my office, I still have to function. I have to put on my game face and I have to do the work that I have to do. And all of us do that. That You cannot be a person of color, particularly an African-American man in this uh, society and not have that ability to compartmentalize. And we do that to cope. And one of the things that's been interesting about uh, this um, most recent set of incidents that have just, I think, torn at and exposed the, the level of racism uh, that we have in our country is I really feel like it has torn away much of our PPE, that protective uh, uh, equipment, that those protective strategies that we have and that we use every day. Uh, one of the words that I hear over and over again when, I, when we check in with people is, I'm just tired. I'm just tired. Uh, you hear that over and over again. And I think it's people are just tired because it is work to put on that, that equipment to, to, to be in uh, an environment where you are having to process all of the time what is happening. Is this happening because of my race? Is it happening because of something else? It's like, um, you know, when you have your, your, your phone open and you have a lot of apps running at the same time. That's what it's like to be a, a person of color, an African-American man in, in, our, in our culture, because you're always having to run these apps to figure out and interpret what is happening to you. And it takes a toll. And, and I think the reason that I have heard uh, so many people talk about, um, I'm just tired, is because they are tired of having to, um, to uh, constantly deal with those issues and in the midst of the worst pandemic that we've had since 1918, and the worst uh, economic um, crisis that we've experienced since the Great Depression, since we learned that people of color are being disproportionately impacted, we still have to deal with the kind of uh, uh, inhumanity that we saw in uh, Minneapolis. And I think people are just tired of that. And so I, I think it really speaks to how important it is for us to uh, understand that and to have coping strategies that are adaptive. Thank you. And I, I have a follow-up question. Um, so 
particularly when we're talking about mental health and emotional wellness among um, people of color, especially black people, especially black men, um, it, it's important for us to destigmatize the idea that uh, mental health awareness is something that we ought to be leaning into. Why do we need to shift that conversation? How do we change the conversation knowing um, the physical and emotional toll that trauma play has on black people, especially in moments like this. So you know, um, talking about stig stigmatization sure, and what we need, sure. yeah. I, you know, um, I, I, think it, I think it is changing. When I came into the field 30 years ago, uh, black folks were not talking about um, mental health. They just weren't. And, um, but you've seen a shift in that. Before I, I came to the American Psychological Association, I was, uh, the commissioner in Philadelphia for behavioral health. And one of the things we wanted to do is to reach out to and get black men talking about, actually men of color, uh, Latino, Asian men as well, uh, talking about mental health um, because it, it is so important. It impacts us. You heard the, the president talking about that a, a little while ago. And, um, but we don't talk about it. We don't even have the language. You ask the typical brother, how are you doing? you know, is fine and, you know, you keep it moving, uh, even if it's not fine. And, and so we had to figure out a way to get men to talk about it. And one of the things we do is we partnered with a, a storytelling organization in Philadelphia. Uh, and first of all, I, I didn't think we were gonna be able to get men to talk about issues of mental wellness and issues of mental health. We didn't talk about pathology. We talked about what do we have to do and what's your story around your own mental wellness and what have you done? Well, we got men to, um, to, to tell their stories publicly. We work, they work with professional storytellers. We storytellers, we um, uh, put on a, a production, uh, it was professionally done. Uh, and what really surprised me was not only were we able to get men to tell their stories, but we got people to come and hear those stories. The first venue we did it in, we, we, we sold out that venue. We actually didn't charge people, it was a free event, but the, the venue um, filled up 300 people in Philadelphia on a Friday night talking about black men's mental health. Next time we did it, same thing, filled up the venue, 600 people on a Friday night in Philadelphia talking about black men's mental health. The next time we did it, we had a thousand people talking about black men's mental health. And what that told us and what it told me is that this is a conversation that we want to have, but we have to create forms and mechanisms to do that in a way that people feel safe and people can uh, have that conversation. And we have to change the language. So I'm very hopeful that if we use innovative strategies, if we knew, use the things that we know about our culture, that we can create forms for people to have these conversations and what really uh, surprised me, one of the things we did is we, we had not only men from the community, so we have teachers and bus drivers and just regular guys, but we would always bring in a celebrity. And I really thought that, because at the end of the, the uh, presentation, uh, we would have a talk back with the, the audience. And I really thought that after the celebrity spoke, everybody's gonna leave. That didn't happen. Mothers brought their sons, People brought their, you know, their, their group, their community groups, and people wanted to have that, that conversation. And it is because they know that these are issues that are affecting us, is affecting our abilities to be a father, to be um, a, 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 a worker or where, whatever it is that we have to do. And, uh, and the more we can have those conversations, the better off we're gonna be as a, as a community. Thank you so much, Dr. Evans. I don't want to let you go before you before you give people um, some a note about the resource page that you all are developing. Yeah, people should go to our resource page. It's uh, apa.org. If you go to our landing page, uh, we have some resources uh, that you can get to on race and racism. Uh, and I just want to say one other thing. It's so important for us to check in with each other. So the next time a brother says to you, I'm all right, say, but how are you? And when they say, all right, say, but how are you? And give them that space to talk about how they're really feeling because it's so important. We know from a lot of psychological research, the most important thing that we can do for our mental health is to have close connections and support. 
And if we do that, it'll go a long way in helping to create the kind of mental wellness that we need in our community. Dr. Evans, thank you not only for your participation on this, on this call, um, but for the work that you're doing. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. I wanna take a moment to introduce um, Greg Hodge and Hector Sanchez Flores, who are two members of the MBK Alliance um, partner organizations. Greg Hodge is the Chief Network Officer of the Brotherhood of Elders, and Hector Sanchez is the, is the Executive Director of the National Compadres Network. Um, both are close to the work of bringing healing to people of color and are going to engage us all in um, a space that they're curating for us to have some collective healing. So Greg Hodge and Hector Sanchez, I welcome you to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you for having us here. Thank you, it's a pleasure that everybody is joining us in this beautiful space to learn, live, and grow and begin to heal together. I wanna to begin that this is not news to us and let us uh, ask for permission first. You know, even though we're all here virtually, let us remember that the first thing that every young man should learn is to ask for permission, whether it is to walk in through a door or walk into a new space. But before we go into ceremony, to ask for permission from the elders, that what we're going to do is, an intent, is the intent is honorable and it's good. And so although I cannot hear, I'm going to ask Baba Greg if he will, uh, by nodding or saying, Ashe, uh, give us permission to get going. Yeah, I shall. I shall. <clears throat> I want to acknowledge all the elders and native people of the lands from shore to shore that were here before everyone arrived when, when they were the caretakers of this beautiful space. Let us get closer to what teachings they offer us to be able to be caretakers of this beautiful earth and, and maybe relearn and be reminded of why we're here. I also want to remind us that, um, that we know what we're supposed to do that our spirit and our hearts know what we need to do and let us be able to move these things away so that clarity can come from us so that we can remember that our great, 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 great grandmothers prayed for us. That our great, 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 great grandfathers prayed for us and that we carry those prayers to this day and that if we just sit quietly for a moment, maybe we'll be reminded of what those prayers sounded like, what those intentions were, and that maybe we can then lift them up along with ours. As we move forward, I want the beautiful young people that are on this call, that have shared their beautiful gifts and their teachings, that as they move and strive for us to get to a new place, to look over their shoulders and remember the elders that have been trying to keep up that we want to be with you. We want to see what you are creating. And so as you move forward, please remember, please remember that we want to be along for the ride too. And that you are building on the gifts and talents and dreams of seven generations past. And that if we do this right in seven generations from now, people that will not know our names will know that we did something in an honorable way. And that as we do this together, that we use those sacred words, those Nahuatl words of Entloque Nahuake, which means that we are connected in a sacred way. En la quech, that when I see you, I see myself. You know, that we are together moving forward, not in trauma, but in grace and sacredness and love for one another. So that when you achieve your goal, I am there to celebrate and that we can achieve our collective goals together. That if we do this right, our ancestors will recognize that and they will smile upon us. And although things appear very dark, let us remember that the only way to experience the stars is to walk into the darkness. And that we can do that together. Mm -hmm. Ah, shit. Ashe.
that can make us whole when we're not feeling so great. I give honor to the creator who put all of the breath of every one of us in our bodies. I wanna give honor and praise to those Native Americans on whose land we stand. Here in California where I sit, the Ohlone people, but all the way to the Shawnee, the Choctaw, the Iroquois, the uh, Cherokee and others. I wanna make a libation, an offering, an affirmation. Sometimes we use water to pour onto the earth to acknowledge this connection between the soil and us. I want to bring into this space those Africans, my ancestors, who were brought here on ships against their will, against their, uh, in the integrity of what it meant to be human. I want to bring into this space the Asian Pacific Islander brothers and sisters whose families might have been interned in concentration camps in America during World War II even while their sons were fighting in the Pacific theater in the, in the war. I want to bring into this space my Latinx brothers and sisters, the Chicano and Aslan folks whose um, borders crossed them. They didn't cross the borders. This is Mexico. When I sit in California, Nevada, uh, those places where we, where, we, where we call it the West. Um, but our ancestors who were Latino, who were Latinx, who were La Raza, this is their land as well. I want to pour a libation today for my European ancestors, those who are really true allies, co-conspirators, co-creators in liberation and freedom. So today, as we think about our ancestors, as we acknowledge the people who came before us, as we're in a position to think about the work that is ahead of us, through our tears, through our grieving, through the pain that we find ourselves in, I want to invite us to do three things today to remember, to reflect, and to renew. Remember the contributions of others who went before us. John Lewis is a great example of an elder who has done the work and is leaving and passing the torch. Even as he continues to run the race, he's passing the torch. We have to remember Harriet Tubman's work. We have to remember Cesar Chavez's work. We have to remember Yuri Kojama's work. We have to remember Susan B. Anthony's work because that work and the dreams of those previous generations of ancestors are the reason that we are here. We refuse to die. We refuse to give up. We refuse to say we can't go any further because for every step they took that was difficult, it was a contribution to eternity. It was a contribution to our future. So this afternoon, I want to invite you just for a moment to think about an ancestor. Think about somebody who came before you. It could be a famous person like Malcolm X. It could be a not so famous person like Sarah Tramble, my neighbor, who was a teacher in her own way. Didn't go past the sixth grade in formal education, but had a PhD in life. Said to me when she was in her 90s, I'm going to live to be 100, had a heart attack, died, flatlined in the hospital, came back. Willed herself to live until she turned 100 years old. And I asked her one day after the threat of her health, you know, the health problem had passed, I said, Ms. Tramble, what did you have to, what did you have left to do? You're in your 90s. She said, look, without any hesitation, the reason I came back is because I could be standing here talking to you. Mm. She never, she never took a mindfulness class, never had a yoga instruction, <laughs> probably never read, you know, Dalai Lama, but she knew about being present in the moment in a healthy way. And so I'm going to invite you to think of an ancestor and either write their name on something that's next to you 
Call their name silently, call their name out loud if you can, and say, I remember you. Your memory will not die if I have anything to say about it. And then I want you to reflect on what are the lessons that that ancestor taught you that's going to get you through this pandemic, that's going to get us through the health pandemic, the racism pandemic, the economic crisis that has beset us. What reflection do you have of that ancestor that can say, if they could do what they did in their time and their circumstance, certainly I can contribute to the forward progress of humanity. That I will value all black lives. That I will value the people around me who love me. That I will be the medicine for my community. That I won't let this circumstance be the thing that my children and my children's children talk about. And lastly, what in their story, what in the story of that ancestor renews you? Because we need everybody in this fight, in this spiritual fight. I want you to use your spiritual imagination and think about what is it that renews your spirit? What renews your heart? What renews your hands? The old folks in the churches I grew up in in Arkansas were seeing signs like, child, don't get weary. We don't have time to be, we can be tired, but we also have to get rested. We have to get rested. So I want you to think about an ancestor. Just think about that person. Remember their contribution. Reflect on what they have taught us and allow them re to renew you. And I want us to do one thing before we turn this back to Michael Smith. I want you to, we're going to breathe together. Hmm. George Floyd said, I can't breathe. Eric Garner said, I can't breathe. Brianna Taylor maybe didn't have, even have a chance to even use those words based on how she was murdered. But we want to take the pain of them being not able to breathe and say to ourselves, I can breathe. I want you to take a deep breath right now, wherever you're sitting, a deep breath for your ancestors. And exhale. I want you to take a deep breath. Breathe deeply into your full lungs for your elders. Take a deep breath. And exhale. I want you to take a deep breath for your children. And when I say your children, they don't have to be your biological children. Any children that are in your vicinity, if you being a good person, those are your children. Take a deep breath for your children. And exhale. I want you to take a deep breath for the children who are yet unborn, who will inherit the world that we leave them. Take a deep breath. And exhale. And lastly, lovingly, and with deep gratitude, take a deep breath for yourself, for your divine and sacred self. I want you to inhale. And exhale. And we say Ashe. 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 Be blessed. And I want to thank the Obama Foundation and Michael Smith and the whole team for pulling us together. And I pass it back, back to you, Michael. Baba Greg, thank you so much. Brother Hector Sanchez Flores, thank you so much. Dr. Evans, Lee Kwan Muhammad, Leon Ford Jr., Brian Stevenson the incredible, indomitable hero, Congressman John Lewis, uh, and of course, uh, President Barack Obama, and to our masterful moderator um, who tied all this conversation together, Darnell Moore, uh, thank you so much. Uh, before you go, um, I wanna close this with where we started. Um, today, of course, remember George Floyd, we remember Ahmaud Arbery, remember the far too many lives that we have lost, but we remember Breonna Taylor on her birthday. We speak her name, we fight for justice. We remember the women, way too many of them, whose names gone unnoticed. Sandra Bland, Ayanna Stanley Jones, Tanisha Anderson, Atiana Jefferson, Charlena Lyles, Rakia Boyd, Kayla Moore, Natasha McKenna, Latasha Harlins, and the list goes too far. We speak our sisters' names. We remember them and we fight for justice. Go to Obama.org, donate to Brianna and George's memorial funds, Find bail funds that you can donate to. 
find petitions and connect with organizes, organizations that you can find an organizational home to learn and grow and you can mobilize for action. Read about policing, race, and justice. If you are a mayor, take our pledge to redo, review and reform your use of force policies. Get resources from APA and other organizations on mental health and wellness, including the new Unmute campaign that APA launched in partnership with My Brother's Keeper. And I wanna close with the words of my hero, President Barack Obama, who said, we have more power than we know. We are the change that we seek. So let's unite, let's heal, and let's continue the fight uh, that so many started before us. As Congressman Lewis said, let's get in the way and get in good trouble. Let's create a world that's worthy of our children. Thank you, MBK family. Have a great weekend. Keep fighting.